want to share for you a message. You know, I'm sharing in the area about God's kingdom. And because the Word of God is all about God's kingdom and is about the New Testament is all about His kingdom coming and how we live. And in this particular message, I know the heading, I didn't want to push the heading too much because it sounds a bit awkward. But the heading is just purely called sin. And I know it's like, hey, I'm going to preach on sin. It goes like, I don't want to hear about sin. But I want you to understand that there are two types of sins that I think about in the Christian world. I'm not saying there's only two sins, but two types of sins. There is the sin of not knowing Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. Amen? And the Bible says that that's eternal, then a separation from God. The only way to know Jesus is to repent, right? And that's not the sin I'm talking about today. But I'm talking about another sin. And I'm talking about the sin that even though we've given control of our hearts to Jesus, see, before we get saved, the inner part of our control is the sins of this world, right? Can you agree with me there? But when we get saved, we remove that authority and we put Jesus at the control. But as the Apostle Paul says in Romans, we still have sin in this brick and mortar. It's still here. It's not here, but it's still here. And the only way that we deal with this here is by growing what's in here, which is the light of Jesus Christ. You know, anytime a human experiences malnutrition, doctors want to check and observe to see if there's signs of what they might call stunted growth. It's the same way that the Word of God wants to check our hearts daily to make sure there's not malnutrition, meaning to make sure that we are still feeding on God's Word because when we allow this sin of this brick and mortar to infiltrate into our hearts, it stunts our growth. It stops us from reaching the potential that God wants us to reach. It's in 1 Peter that Peter says that we are meant to be a holy people. And holiness is not by our things we do. It's, it's not by uh, a Sabbath. It's not by uh, laws or regulation. But holiness is about us drawing closer to God. And then in us drawing closer to God, we draw closer to other people with the message of God. The, the very reason why I wanted to be in the synagogue and I wanted to be there as a Christian, and we may know a Christian, is because I wanted God's presence to be flowing with me and through me to these people to tell them that I love them and I'm praying for them. But at the same time, I was open to share that message to any Palestinian too when I went down to King George Square. The only problem is they just wanted to shout at me and not listen to me, so there's not much I can do. But we are His ambassadors, that we are meant to be His representation. We're meant to be the light that shines in the midst of darkness. Paul says in Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore we have been justified by faith, meaning we have been made right by our faith. Therefore we have peace with God. See, whenever you struggle for lack of peace, my counsel is draw close to Him. Draw close to Him. I love talking to Darren. I don't talk to him enough. I love talking to Darren in the midst of everything that happens because every time I talk to him, ring him up, he says, it's okay, I have peace. It's okay, God's at work. And, and, and it's not, I don't believe that Darren's misleading me or being false to me. I say, I don't believe that. But I really believe in the genuineness of Darren's heart, he taps into Christ. What I call tapping into Christ means he's having fellowship with God. When you have fellowship with God, you're tapping into Christ. And tapping into Christ gives you a peace that does not disappoint. I go back to this passage that said in Proverbs. It says, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. Hope that isn't fulfilled makes you feel sickly. But it says, Hope fulfilled is the tree of life and the only place we find true hope fulfilment is in Christ Jesus. Now, the world and the non-believers of the world can look attractive. In fact, you can read through Psalms where the psalmist says, why is it that it seems the unrighteous seems to succeed and the righteous seem to not succeed? And there are certain passages of Scriptures in the Psalms where it seems like it's 
a cry or a lament or, 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 or a hurt that's saying, if I'm a believer, why am I not seeing the benefits? So, so here is the issue. What makes us effective is not who we are, not what we have, but rather whom we are connected to. You see, a non-believer is like a freshly cut flower in a vase or a vase, depending what you want to say. You look at it and it was cut right at its best moment of bloom. And it's sitting in that vase. And as far as you can be concerned, you only see that top part. You only see that flower. You see its beauty. You smell its aroma. You look at its appearance or its form. But what you don't realise, that's the best it will ever be. And from then on, the Bible says it will wither. And it will wither because it's not connected to the source. Now, you and I may not measure up completely to some of the things that are happening in the world in regards to finances or other things or appearances. But we can only move up because of our source. We can only move forward because of our source. Because we are connected. That's why in John 15, it says we abide in Him and He abides in us. We stay connected and it's the source. And the way in which we move or we continue to grow is because we continue to put ourselves in the light of who God is. In that moment, it could seem like the world has an advantage. In the long run, it's not so. You see, the Christian walk is a walk that has to be maintained. It's not that so many years ago I gave my life to Jesus. It's that I have to continue to move in my faith and move in the area. It's not that I haven't given my heart to the Lord. But the problem is, as Paul says in Romans, is that I still have this brick and mortar that has sin. And that brick and mortar is not in the control centre, but it wants to seep in and influence what's at my heart. And if I allow those things to seep in into my heart, it's not that I'm no longer saved, but it stunts my growth. The Apostle John wrote in the epistle, 1 John, chapter 1, verse 5, he says, this is the message that we have heard from Christ. And therefore we announce to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness. Have you ever walked from a dark or dull area into a brightly lit room? Or have you ever come out of the house in the middle of a bright day and the sun's caught you and you go like, wow, that's that's bright. And ever had that experience? Maybe you'll have it today when you walk outside of the church. Well, that's what it's like walking into God's presence. When you walk into God's presence, it can seem to be so overwhelming that you can feel uncomfortable. If you're not used to the presence of God, if you're not used to the fullness of God, it can seem uncomfortable and you can feel a variety of emotions. Uh, You may well feel convicted. Uh, You you may well feel challenged. Uh, You may well feel unworthy. Uh, You may well feel moved emotionally because of things that are happening. Sandra said to me uh, yesterday, uh, uh, with a particular person I've met with four or five times, a Christian, Sandra says, why is it every time you meet this guy, the guy cries? I said, how do you know it's not you? She says, because I haven't been with you every time when the guy cries. I said, I said, I don't think it's any bad thing. I said, but maybe in those moments, just the love of God, which is a kingdom thing, is overflowing. And there's a need for this person to feel the love that they get moved in that area. The light of God's holy presence is never a condemning one. I've shared this before. What's the difference between condemnation and conviction? Well, if someone says, I'm not going to that church anymore because I feel condemned, what they're really saying is, the devil has a hold of me. Because condemnation says, you are damned, there's no way out. That's the devil. But God never damns you and says, there's no way out. But the Lord will convict. So when you come in the house of God and you feel conviction, that's God saying, get it right. Get it right because I desire fellowship with you. Get it right so I can come and be intimate with you. But we have to be careful as Christians because if we walk long enough in the darkness or if we walk long enough in the shadows, guess what happens? We adjust. 
Have you ever had to jump out of bed in the middle of the night, maybe to go to the restroom? Well, maybe you're too young to do that yet, okay? But you have to go to the middle of the night to go to the restroom, and all of a sudden, you kicked your toe. Anyone ever done that? All right, just me, maybe, me and Lynn, okay? You kick your toe, and then what's meant to be silent is no longer silent because you walk, you work, you partner up, jumping, and they go, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, ah. What'd you do? I stumped my toe. Well, how? Well, I didn't turn the light on. Well, why didn't you turn the light on? Because you're asleep. Well, am I awake now? You know what I'm saying? I said, yeah, but I got a sore toe. If we walk in the darkness and the light, this is what happens. We kick our toes. We hurt our body. We, we hurt who we are in Christ. And God wants us to walk in light so that we know where we're putting our feet. John says, in Christ, there is no darkness. The problem is, is that we adjust to darkness. So if this particular spot here represents God's glory, God's presence, and we are the Christians, we know it's here, not that we walk in darkness, but we just walk in the shadow. Like, I'm here, but we're not there. I'm here, but I'm not there. And the reason why we walk in the shadow is because we know if we walk right out into the light, the conviction is so strong. But if we walk in the shadow, it's like, well, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I'm trying. Uh, uh, it's a process. Yeah, I, I know I, I said I repent, but, you know, I, I still like having sex outside of marriage. Well, yeah, I know I, I said I repent and I'm safe, but I still like to do all these things and go on and go on and go on and go on. So we walk in the shadow. That's why in church we have so many spiritual dwarfs. Because we are stagnant or we are malnourished because we don't want to come to the Word. In 1 John 1, 6, John says, If we say that we have fellowship with Him, Christ, and walk in the darkness, then we lie. You can't say one thing and then another. And then in verse 7, there's even more insight. John says, if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, listen, we have fellowship with one another. Have you met those Christians who say, I don't need to go to church? Have you met those Christians who say, oh, don't ask me to come too often. Don't ask me to come twice. Don't ask me to come every week. Don't ask me to come too often. You, you know what it means according to the Scriptures? You know what it means? Not Sean. You're not walking in the light. When you're walking in the light, this is what the Word of God says here in 1 John 1, 7, you want to be in fellowship. Why? Because you're the same like-minded people. But when you're not walking in the light, you can find it saying, well, I don't want to go to church. Why not? There's too many hypocrites. I don't want to go to church. Why? They're not friendly. I don't want to go to church. Why? I feel condemned or judged. I don't want to go to church. Why? Well, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not forsake the assembly, come together as many have been doing. But John goes close. He says, when you don't want to be in fellowship, it means you're not walking in the light. Because when you're in the light, you want to be with others in the light because we encourage and spur one another along. But when you're in the shadows, you don't want to be there because it's too bright. Now, I appreciate very much that we live stream. But there are other persons who prefer live stream than be in the house. And with love, I tell you, it's because you don't understand the light. You're working like this. You're working on the edge. It's like this. And they'll always tell you what's wrong with being in church. Well, since when was the church perfect? Sandra would have a habit of leaving a purse in the front row open and everything in it. And I said, Sandra, don't leave your handbag open in the front row. She goes, well, it's church. I said, that's exactly right. It's church. Church is a place for sinners. Now, I know all of you are good. <laughs> but you get the odd one that's still working their way to be good. That's why in children's ministry, we protect it. We don't just let anybody walk in the children's ministry. We protect it. But it's church. That's right. It's church, which means we open the door to sinners. Hello. So it's no good talking about the inadequacies of the church. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Church is not about what you get, it's about what we give. The kingdom of God is that once you understand the fullness of God, then the very essence of you being a Christian is that you want to be in fellowship or bringing the light to others. 
And if you're not, it means you're not in it. So when you say, I don't want to be there, or I'm too tired, or I don't want to do it, and there's some genuine times it happens. But why? I'm too tired to be in church. Well, you're not too tired to go to work. You're not too tired to go shopping. You're not too tired to hang out with your family. Why is it church? Why is it church? I'll tell you why it is. Because in this brick and mortar is flesh and sin. And that brick and mortar wants to seep into the control center of your heart, which is the Holy Spirit. And it wants to infiltrate and say, no, we don't want to do it. See, kingdom people want to be with kingdom people. Kingdom people want to advance the kingdom. And that's why sometimes we get so stunted in our growth. See, walking in the light doesn't mean I am without fault. Walking in the light doesn't mean that I don't sin. In fact, John says in verse 8, if we say that we don't have sin, we're lying. For anyone to say, I'm without sin, they're a liars. But walking in the light means that we recognise we have sin, but I want to walk in the light because I want God to deal with my sin. I love the story. I've always loved the story of Isaiah 6. My messages many times would be, whom shall I send? <laughs> Ever heard that message? Whom shall I send? The cry of God to Isaiah. Cleanse me, then send me. But when you look at the story of Isaiah 6 and you see the prophet being in God's presence and he has this incredible, I don't know, vision or transformation. I don't know what it is. But he has this incredible vision of the altar area of God and he sees the altar and he sees the seraphim and he sees the altar and all of a sudden God's presence is so bright, so bright, so radiant that all of a sudden he sees perhaps what he hadn't seen before. He said, I am unclean. Now, when he's on earth, he looks pretty good. Because as a prophet, everybody else looks so dirty, he looks radiant. Everybody else looks so naughty, he looks fantastic. But when he stands in the presence of God, to everybody who's religious, I'd say to you, get in the light of God. Because if you're religious, you might be around others and by your works, you might look pretty good. But when you get in the light of God, those works don't look so good. The seraphim, well, you know, the seraphim are six-winged, I don't know if angels or not, but six-winged critters. Two of them covers the face. Two of them wings cover the private and the feet, and the other two are able to fly. And they're different to the cherubim. The cherubim are four-winged figures. And the cherubim is found uh, on the Ark of the Covenant. The cherubim are a different group. They have four wings. And the reason why they have four wings is because the Bible says they have four faces. They have the face of the ox. They have the face of the eagle. They have the face of the lion. And they have the face of man. And some say the seraphim have the highest standard because it's at the altar of God. And some say the cherub is second because it's on the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know. I don't have to worry about it. But this is what I know, that when you go into God's presence, things happen that can be unusual. When you come into God's presence, things are exposed that you perhaps you don't want to expose. And so you're left with a choice. Do I cover it or do I confess it? When Isaiah came before God, it was a matter of, do I cover it? Do I confess it? Do I run away or do I stand and say, God, deal with me? Thank God Isaiah said, I'm unclean. And the seraphim came forward with a, a coal uh, from the altar and touched his lips. And he says, okay, whom shall I send? And he said, Lord, send me. It's not what you have to do to be clean. It's what God does in you that makes you clean. I know the scripture in 1 John 1 9. I'm sure you know it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that word cleanse as an actual verb in the Greek means continuous. It doesn't mean one off when I ask Jesus in my heart, but it means it's a continuous process. The more I come into God's presence, the more I realize I'm a sinner, and the more I realize I need to deal with things because it's a continuous process. I need God's presence every day. The problem is a lot of us treat sin like laundry. We just let it stack up. That's how we treat sin. See, God says, the moment you feel sin or inadequacy, in that moment, deal with it. But what we do, like, ah, oh, nah, I'll just throw that dirty shit behind the door. 
Oh, no, I'll just throw those socks off behind the door. Oh, I'll take the underwear off. Oh, I'll take the... Oh, we just pile it up, pile up. Then all of a sudden you'll see someone come to the altar, broken before God, praise God they do. And we say to them, this is your first time? No, it's a rededication. The reason why they're ded- rededicating is because they've allowed their dirty laundry to stack up. They've allowed the sin to stack up until it comes to the point where it's like, it's make or break, I need to get right with God. And they come down with all their dirty laundry like, where's the washing machine? Now the believers go like, ooh, 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 he stinks. Dirty clothes. It's like the prodigal son, right? Luke 15. The Bible tells us that the prodigal son, okay, is in a pig pen. Have you ever been around pigs? They stink. I mean, they stink. I, I remember when I was a kid, I think I was like 14 or 15, I, I spent a week or two weeks at a, a friend's uh, farm out there in uh, Laidley and they had pigs, young pigs. And uh, they asked us to get in there because they had to give them inoculations to grab them. I tell you, my clothes were ruined. I stunk like there was no tomorrow. And the reason why, because those pigs were so fast and scrummy, I was going flying everywhere all over there. Well, you know what, you know what I'm saying? And it was terrible. No wonder they asked the kid to go in there to get them. And the Bible says that this young man, this prodigal son was in the pig pen and he was filled with the stench of sin of that pig pen. But then he agreed with God's conviction that he was in the wrong and after he made confession, he changed direction. See, when I repent, I change direction. Repentance is a change direction. Confession is getting me in that God's presence. When I repented of my sin, it got me saved. But when I confess my sins, it keeps me in the light. Then he changed his direction, he got up And he went out of that pig pen and he went back to his dad. Now his dad received him, but guess what? He still smelt like pig. So his dad celebrated his return, but his dad said, put on some new clothes, please, for the sake of everybody, put on some new clothes. And that's the same thing that happens. When we get saved, we get taken out of the pig pen. When we come to the Lord, he hugs us, but then begins the journey of being changed. People tell me, isn't it great this person got saved? And I said, well, I know they made a decision. No, isn't it great they got saved? And I said, well, I know they made a decision. They said, why won't you say saved? I said, because I want to see them take those pig pen clothes off. See, there are people who make decisions and we claim salvation, but salvation according to Luke 5, 8 is repentance. It's a change of heart, it's a change of action. It's a change of how we live. And so the father, in celebrating the return of his son, says, take off those clothes, put on the new robe. And that's what it is. See, our repentance takes us out of the pig pen. It takes us into the arms of the father. But our salvation is how we derobe from the sins of this world, the stench of this world, and we put on the new garments of praise, the garments of righteousness, the garments of love, the garments of light. If we claim to be Christians and we're still walking around in pig pen clothes, then we haven't experienced the fullness of salvation. There'll always be somebody who won't agree with your salvation. The prodigal son's older brother said, I don't believe he shouldn't be here. He doesn't want to always be somebody. But we don't focus on the somebody. We focus that we were lost and now we're saved. And we focus on the fact that God has made a difference. Sorry, could the musicians please come up here for me? God is a God of love. But God is also a God of change. God knew us even before we were conceived, which means perfection. And God has a call, an anointing and a purpose for each of us. It's knowing God that counts. It's knowing His salvation. It's knowing His redemption. It's knowing about His love. But if we are meant to be kingdom people, if we're meant to be people who are walking after God around ourselves, then the sign is not merely us asking Jesus in our heart, but the Bible says, according to John, that not only do we get saved, but we want to be in fellowship with others. 
For a Christian to say they're saved but they don't want to be in fellowship means that they're not in fellowship with God as they should be because when you're in fellowship, that's like saying, I love God but I don't like Christians. And there are people who say that. I love God, I don't love people. Listen, if your horizontal's not in place, there is no vertical. If you say, hey, I love God, vertical, but I don't like people, horizontal, then you don't know God. For God so loved this world that He gave. It didn't say, for God so loved this world that He took. For God so loved this world that He gave. And if we are God's people, we are God's children, then we are the same way. If we love God, we love people. If we don't love people, then we haven't got the love of God. If you don't love Jews, you don't love God. If you don't love Palestinians and God's love, then you don't love God. If you don't love the person who's done you wrong, you don't know God. Now, I excuse the Jews because, they're, they're, the Orthodox Jews, because they're living under the old. It's eye for eye. But I am not. I have been liberated with something new. I can't claim ignorance because I've tasted and seen Jesus. Jesus said in the Beatitudes of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you heard it said, but I tell you. 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 Because Jesus said, there is an error in translation. There's an error in this error and you need to hear through Christ. In the old, I heard through a man, but in the new, I hear it through the Son of Man. Jesus, is just, Jesus didn't just come to preach. He came to proclaim the kingdom of God was at hand. And we are His ambassadors. We are His representation. I want us to be kingdom people. But being a kingdom person is a journey. Now tomorrow, I'm 61. You already hit there, Rick. <laughs> Shane certainly has already hit there. Hey. And I'm still on that journey. I tell you, when I look back 20 years ago, if you don't mind me saying, I'm a lot better than I was. Did you hear my wife laugh then? That means she's giving me an amen. I'm a whole lot better. I was gonna use a word I shouldn't use. I was gonna say, I'm a heck of a lot better than I was, but excuse the bad English. But I also know in another 10 years, I'm gonna be a heck of a lot better than I am now. There's a new improved model that's coming. How do you know? Because I'm working on it. Well, actually, he's working on it. How's it happen? I gotta keep coming into light. And when that light comes, sometimes it's so bright, it's like, man, it hurts my eyes. Man, I, I find it hard to see because his presence is so big. Bring that seraphim, bring that six-winged godly thing down here and touch my lips with the call of that altar. But you know what we're like. Some of go, like I said, it's too bright. Maybe I'll just. I can still see, but I'm not in the direct light. I'm, I'm in the shadow. I can just move around. So it, it will excuse my lack of godliness. It will excuse my lack of fervour for the Lord. It will excuse my behaviour. I just, you know, look, look, my toes are in the light. You know what I mean? And, and that's okay, my toes. I mean, you can see me in the shadow, right? You can see, I'm here. You can see me in the shadow. But don't ask me to come right out in the light because... I get overwhelmed, I get moved, I get challenged, I get convicted. I, 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 I even have brothers and sisters who in love, although it doesn't feel like love, put their arm around me and say, brother, perhaps you need to work with it. Who, who are you to tell me I need to work with it? I'm going back out to the shadow. Oh, you're so judgmental. Oh, you're so wrong. I'm gonna stay here. I love God. Oh, but it's you Christians. If this was another Christians, God would be great. Oh, it would be good then you don't know the light because it's kingdom. It's kingdom. It's kingdom. It's kingdom. Kingdom is different. The kingdom is not about us advancing our agenda. It's not about us advancing our desires or our will. But Him. Now, I've got to be honest with you and I don't mean to sound condescending but I was a bit bemused there are all sorts of Christians who say they support Israel and do all sorts of things. I didn't see any of them in the garden. 
on a particular night when Hamas declared war on all Jews. And I asked them, where were you? We had our own private meetings. People, they don't need a private meeting. They, they needed you to be in there so that we could stand with you. But that's what I felt. Maybe I'm totally wrong. Could be, wouldn't be the first, won't be the last time. I'm not talking about you personally. I'm talking about others who tell me so strong how they feel. You see, brothers and sisters, when you get in the light, it's bright. When you get in the light, you're not hidden. When you get in the light, there's no shadows. But we get scared of the light because there's still some flesh we want to hang on to. Still promiscuity. There's still habits and things we hang on to. I don't want to walk in the light. I still have my habits. I don't understand Christians sometimes, but I just, I don't have to. I just have to love them. I was talking to one wonderful lady, I don't know, 30s. And I don't mean to be despairing, but just sharing it. And I said, you got a tattoo. I mean, Tattoo doesn't mean you're going to, not going to, I mean, you know, I'm not saying you go one way or the other. If tattoos, it's up to you. I mean, my dad had tattoos. That's why I said, I'm never going to have a tattoo. You know what I'm trying to say? So does it happen? She's she like 30 to 40, had a tattoo right here. Stood away, she said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, well, you got a tattoo. Why are you trying to hide it? I mean, like it's so big on your on the forearm. The friend said, oh, she's had it for ages. Oh. I said, how long is that? Three months. I said, well, it's not ages. I said, oh, yeah, it's pretty, it's nice. Would you get one? I said, no, I, I wouldn't get one, but it doesn't mean I'm judging you if I haven't one. I just said, I haven't seen it before. Why'd you get it? Oh, because my favourite female preacher I mean, at 79 years of age said, I'm getting tattooed. I go, what? My favourite female preacher, she's 79 years old, far more famous than I do so I'm getting not one but two tattoos just to stir up the religious. I go like, so that's what you do? You stir up the religious by getting tattooed? Huh? I, huh? Don't worry, you got your secret tattoo. I'm not judging you. You can put them all over you. I don't care. I love you. God loves you. What difference does it make, right, Danny? We don't care. Huh? Yeah. You belong on Fantasy Island. I called you tattoo, tattoo. You know what I mean? Well, my days go there. Doesn't worry me. But I get a tattoo because I'm 79. I want to stir up the religion. I get a tattoo because a 79 woman preacher got a tattoo. That's the reason I got a tattoo. Yet the scriptures say to us, be my light. Be my light. Have you got a tattoo? Don't get upset. I'm not against you for your tattoos. I've got staff who've got tattoos and they're great people. I love them. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Just because Shane's got a big tattoo on his back here that says Sean doesn't mean anything bad. You know what I mean? Because Sean's already kicked. Okay, he doesn't. Okay, uh, he doesn't. All right. It's on his shoulder. Okay. In the shoulder. I'm just teasing. doesn't worry me. I, do what you want to do. It's your body. You know what you say? But I was just wondering, could we be so bold, strong about kingdom? Could we be so bold and strong about kingdom? It's not about me defying a religious spirit. Ah! It's not about me following a preacher. It's about me grabbing kingdom. Hmm. We bow our heads right now. Two types of sin. The first one is you don't know Jesus. So you're away from the Lord. This sin is the most serious one. Because this one means you have no future in eternity. And you are an eternal being. You will live forever. Question is where? So if you're sitting here today and you're saying, Pastor, I don't know Jesus, then you need to get saved. There's also the other person right now. You need to come back to the Lord. And the reason why you need to come back to the Lord is you haven't been dealing with your sin. You've treaded like dirty laundry. You just kept throwing in the corner, throwing in the corner, throwing in the corner. Now the pile is so big, you're doubting your salvation. You need to come back to God. So if you don't know the Lord or you're away from the Lord and you need to get saved, would you raise your hand right now? If you don't know the Lord or you're away from the Lord and you need to come back to Him, raise your hand. Friend, 
Don't waste the moment. Come to Jesus. Now let's all stand. The Bible says, for he who says they have no sin, they are a liar. So I have no problem saying let's all stand because I know that we all have sin. Now, it's not the sin that means we aren't saved. I know you're saved. It's not the sin that says you're not walking to God, but it's the sin that stunts our growth. God wants you to be a giant in the faith, not a dwarf in the faith. So Father, I stand with friends. I don't stand above them. I don't stand under them. I stand beside them by saying this, we are on a journey and You are the light. And You have called us to walk in the light. And if we walk in the light as You are the light, then You reveal to us every time what we need to deal with. My tongue, my words, my confession, my attitude, my behaviour, my temper, desires, my feelings. You will speak to me. And I will desire to be in fellowship because I'm with same like-minded people. I pray the peace of God, His surpassing greatness and understanding, His wisdom and power to rest upon each and every one. In the name of Jesus. In the name of, oh, one more time. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated.